Amen. Okay, keep your place there in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to be coming back, put a bookmark there, because we're going to be coming back to that uh, chapter throughout the sermon. Let me first um, introduce to you what the Seasons of Life sermon series is all about and what it will entail. So I've kind of broken it down into four separate sermons. The first sermon, which is this morning, is going to be called The Single Life. The Single Life. And then we're going to talk about next week, we'll talk about The Married Life. And then we're talking about uh, we're going to talk about raising young children, and then we're talking about we'll talk about raising older children. And um, the challenge of this morning's sermon was that the first and the fourth sermons are kind of going to intersect each other. The whole idea is to give us a, a loop of our of our seasons of life here. And it's it's not so much the age that you are; it's more of the the season that you're at in your life. Okay. So when I talk about the single life, you know, I'll be directing the sermon towards the youth. Uh, mainly, but you know, if you're a single person, you know, that obviously applies to you as well. So, um, the first sermon series this morning is called The Single Life. The Single Life. Now, I first want to talk about a little bit um, that's going on in this chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This is Paul's perspective, this chapter. Okay, and Paul says this in verse number 6. And, you know, let me explain my opinion on this. Um, you know, I could be wrong, but this is just my, my opinion on, on Paul's statements here. In verse number 6, Paul says, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. But in then verse number 40, he says, he ends the whole chapter with this thought, And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. So when we read this um, chapter, because mainly what Paul is talking about here is the decision to be married or the decision to stay single. That's one of the main themes of this chapter. And what he's talking about when he says, you know, I speak this by permission and not of commandment, then he also says, you know, but hey, I have the Spirit of God. I also have the Spirit of God. Paul's just letting us know here that he's speaking from his own personal perspective as a single person. Okay? It's not that the advice that he's giving is not the Word of God. It's not that it's not true. It's not that, you know, it's just his, you know, opinion outside of the Word of God. He's just giving us, he's letting us know, and you'll see that throughout the chapter. He's just letting us know that, hey, this is from the perspective of where I am at in my life, okay? It's still godly advice from the Holy Spirit, okay? So, let's go into the chapter knowing that. You know, he's letting us know and he's telling us these things from his personal perspective as a single person. So as I preach this sermon on the single life today, I am going to focus heavily on the perspective of Paul as well. Okay? So Paul, single people in the room, Paul is probably the greatest example that we have in the Bible of a single person, especially a single man. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 7 gives us his perspective on being single or married. And let me tell you, the standards are high with Paul, okay? So I first want to focus today on, you know, this is about the single life. So Paul is telling us from his perspective on the single life. I want to focus on the dangers first of the single life. Then we'll talk about, you know, some advantages that single people have. But we'll first start with the dangers of the single life, because there are dangers of the single life. And I have personally talked to people, um, you know, about the dangers of the single life to single people, because it's, it's important that you understand this, and if you are single, you're going to remain single, or you're just going to be single for the next few years, you need to understand the dangers that you specifically as a single person will face in your life. Okay, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. So first of all, you know, this position of, you know, being single, you know, it's not just about, you know, being young. It's about, it's more of your position in life is what I'm aiming at here. And if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, in verse number 2, we see, you know, let's read the qualifications of a pastor, okay? In 1 Timothy chapter 3, in verse number 2, the Bible says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now this is not talking so much about the age of a person as, as it's talking about their position in life. They need to be, a pastor needs to be someone who is experienced in marriage and raising children. I mean, who would want to listen to someone preach a sermon about raising children who doesn't have any children, 
You know, that's really strange about the Catholics, right? I mean, you got this guy that's never been married, he's never you know, going to get married, you know, we'll leave that one alone, but he's going to give you advice on raising your children, and, and it's, it's weird. You know, so I mean, it makes sense that God would have these qualifications, okay, for a pastor. So when I talk about a single person, I'm talking about, you know, you could be, it, you, mainly it's the youth, but it could also just be somebody who's not married, doesn't have children, things like that, okay? So you need to have that experience. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 12. We're talking about the dangers of being single, of, of being young. And I'm speaking to those who are not married with children. So the first danger is this. We're going to read an example in 1 Kings chapter 12. And we're looking at Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And, so, and Rehoboam has just taken over the kingdom. And he's having a little bit of an issue here in 1 Kings chapter 12. Let's look down at verse number 1 and let's read this story. And then we'll talk about the first danger of youth. And Rehoboam, the Bible reads, went to Sechem, for all Israel were come to Sechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father, and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. And kingdom, he said, let me, let me think about it, he told the people. And the king Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words toward them, to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, his friends, his buddies, and which stood before him. So notice that the old men told him that if you will be a servant to those people, then they will serve you. Okay, that's, that's a sermon for another time. But they gave him some advice, and let's see what he did. Then he went to his friends, in verse number 9, and he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people, who have spoken unto me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put, a, uh, put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but thou make it, thou it lighter unto us. Thus shall say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than thy father's loins. He's saying that his friends tell him, You tell them how it's going to be. You tell them that I'm, you're going to bring the hammer down harder on them than, than Solomon ever did, is what his friends said. And now, whereas my father did laid you with a heavy yoke, they continue with this advice, I will add to your yoke. My father has chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly, and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him, and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Now, you see here that Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 4. Now let's look at the, 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 the gravity of what he actually did here. In 1 Kings chapter 4, just a couple um, pages back in your Bible, look at 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse number 29. So the first danger that I want to talk to you today about being single, especially if you're young in your youth, is that you think you know everything. It's weird, but it's true. And I've been there as well, so don't, don't think that I was you know, some wise person when I was 17 years old. They think that they know everything. Look at 1 Kings chapter 4. Let's look at um, Solomon, who he was, and it kind of gives us a clue of who these old men were. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much, and largeness of heart even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, 
Then Ethan, the Ezraite, then Haman, and Chalcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol. Obviously, these were wise men if he's being compared against them. And his fame was in all nations round about. And you remember that people came from all over the world to, to just hear Solomon you know, speak his wisdom. Solomon was given, you know, the Bible says that Solomon, right here, his wisdom excelled, you know, he was wiser than all men. These old men that Rehoboam forsook the counsel of were the counselors to the wisest man who had ever lived. Think of the power that Rehoboam had in his hands that he just, he just forsook. He just let it go. These men were experienced counselors to Solomon. You know, what you need to understand as a young person is that you basically know nothing. You know, do not let this pride overtake you because Rehoboam lost his kingdom. You know, his kingdom was split after this happened. Pride will destroy you as a young person. It's the most dangerous thing that you could face. And here's another thing that to remember, Rehoboam was king. So when he forsook the counsel of the old men, you know, they probably just quit giving him, giving him counsel anymore. Is probably what happened there. But you, as a young person, if you forsake the counsel of the old men, the old men might be your employer. You know, you're not a king. You know, you, the old men could fire you, is basically what could happen. You know, they have power over you in your life. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. You need to adhere to wise counsel in your youth. That's why God gave it to you. You know, this is one of the, the main reasons, by the way, that you will see young people, and everyone here has seen it, I'm sure, that you will see young people that can't hold down a job for more than a month or two, or even a year. It's because they come into a situation, they know nothing, and they pretend like they know everything. And that's a recipe for just getting you fired. Because people are, the, the old men that actually know things are only going to put up with that for so long. Okay? Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Look, this is the reason that God has surrounded you with wise counsel. This is the reason that God gave Rehoboam the old men to give him counsel. That was very wise counsel that they gave him. Ephesians chapter 4, look down at verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. For the what? for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. God gave you wise counsel in your life, teachers, pastors, your parents, to help you, to edify you, to help you avoid these types of pitfalls. You need to use the tools that God has given you as a young single person, okay? Look, I, I use this to this day, this, this advice. If you can identify the people in your life that can give you wise counsel, you will make leaps and bounds in the Christian life. Because there's two ways to learn things, right? There's the hard way, where you don't listen to people, and you make your own mistakes, and you suffer the consequences. And then, you know, there's the easy way, which is you just listen to the pastors and the teachers that God has given you. If you have two parents at home, those are your teachers. Those are the people that are there to protect you, to help you make those leaps and bounds in your life without you having to fall into the pit. And then they're probably going to be there to help pull you out to a certain degree. But the point is that you, you will make leaps and bounds if you can identify these people in your life and listen to them. I use this today. I'm 42 years old. I use this today. I can go into a work situation and I can identify the people that know what they're talking about quickly and then I listen to those people. I listen to what they have to say. I don't think I know everything about every situation because nobody does. And it helps. It will help you. It will help you not have to make you know, mistakes and learn everything the hard way. Ladies, you know, it's, it's no different for ladies. You know, you're not sure about how to go about certain situations with your children, you, or, or how to homeschool, or how to run a home efficiently. There's people that God has given you that have done this, that, that can help you make those leaps in your Christian life. 
without you having to learn everything the hard way, especially with your children. You don't want to learn things the hard way. Okay? So, we see a danger of being, being young and being single is, is youthful pride. So men, you know, identify the experts in your life. That's, that's the advice I can give you. And then, here's another key. You can't just identify who they are. You have to listen to them. Amen. Okay? You have to listen. You know, two things I told Garrett when he was younger is that when we first moved to Sacramento, was I told him, number one, that you need to be, when there's men in the church talking in a circle or whatever, you know, you need to be listening to the men. Right. You, need to be, you need to be putting yourself into those conversations. That's the first thing I told him. You need to be putting yourself into conversations with, you know, wiser, older men in the church. And then, advice number two is when you get in those situations where you're in with those older men, you shut your mouth and you listen. That's the advice I gave my child. And it's good. You listen to what those men who have wisdom and who have done things, and they have experience what they've done. And ladies, it's no different. Young ladies, listen to the older women in the church who have raised children, who are raising children, who have homeschooled. Listen to them. They will teach you. You will make leaps and bounds in your, in your Christian life. I remember even when I was a little kid, I was like, probably Jacob's age, there was a big, like, the, kind of the culture in my family was after big dinners, like Thanksgiving dinners and things like that. I remember, you know, there was a time when all, all the ladies would um, take all, all the food off the table when everyone was done eating, and the men would sit around the table and talk. And by the time I was maybe eight or nine years old, I got to sit there. And I got to stay, and I got to listen. And I remember, you know, and I didn't say anything, I just listened. Because I'm sure if I would have said something, I, I knew not to say anything. But I would listen to my dad and my grandpa talk, and I still remember how intimidating that was. I would sit there and I would listen to them, and they would talk, and I would just sit in there thinking, how do they know all this stuff? They would talk about the world, they would talk about machines or farming or whatever, and I would just be like, how? I, it, was, it was intimidating for me as a young man, because I was like, how am I going to learn? How did my dad learn all this stuff? How did my grandpa, how does he know all these things? And I would sit there and I would listen to them and think, how am I going to know all this stuff? It was intimidating and it should have been. It should have been to me because it's a responsibility to become that type, of, that type of person, that type of man. So listen, don't be a ray of bone because pride is a serious danger for a single person, both male and female. Okay? The second danger, turn to, uh, turn to Ecclesiastes. I love Ecclesiastes. Let me read for you 2 Timothy chapter 2. The second danger of the single life is this. It's sin. Sin. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse number 22, I'll just read for you. The Bible says, Flee also, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, look down at verse number 9. The Bible teaches that as a young, as single person, you're going to have, you know, sin that you will have to deal with in your life. You're going to have, you know, lust that you will have to deal with. And look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse number 9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in ways of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. You're like, what in the world? What's he telling these kids to do? But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. So he's kind of tongue-in-cheek with the first few words of that verse where he's saying, go ahead and do what you want. Go ahead and do what your heart tells you to do. Go ahead and just look at what you want to look at. He's like, but God will bring you into judgment for that, is what he is saying. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. Look, this is coming from a guy who denied himself nothing. Solomon took his wisdom and his riches and he ruined his own life with it. And he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes so you don't do the same. So I thank God for the book of Ecclesiastes and what he's telling you is that you're going to endure many temptations as a young person and you can use them to ruin your life is the bottom line. It's a dangerous time in your life. 
And I will tell you that if you ask, I mean, it's a dangerous time in your life to be young. Now, Paul says, if you can't contain here, get married. We'll look at that in a little bit. But he's basically fornication, youthful, youthful lust. Turn to 1 Timothy 5. Those are some of the sins that you will deal with as a single person, as a young single person. 1 Timothy 5, let's look at some more sin danger in the single life. 1 Timothy chapter 5, look at verse number 11. The Bible reads, But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. And withal, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, that not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. It's another reason to get married. The sin of idleness. This is a sin that single people will deal with, or will have to deal with. Because look, being single, you don't have the burden that a married man with children has. You don't have three, four, five, however many children to, to burden you. So here's my theory on, on avoiding idleness. I'm gonna, this is my throw yourself into the lake theory. I'm going to share it with you today. Okay? Look, when, I first, when we first moved to Fresno, one of the biggest stresses, the biggest stress that I had personally was how I was going to preach three sermons a week. Pastor Jimenez had asked me to preach sermons before, and sermons were a big deal for me. They took me a long time to prepare. They still do. But they take a long time for me to prepare, and I was just like, how am I going to do this? I don't know how, and, and work a full-time job. But here's, here's the answer to, to myself that I tell myself in those situations. I'm just not going to worry about it. It's just going to happen. And I'm just going to have to grind through it. So it's better, you know, I don't like going up to a lake that's got cold water and just dipping my toe in. I, just, just throw me in, and I'll either drown and die, or I'll learn to swim. And I'm not dead yet, so I'm, I, I'm learning to swim. Okay? And as the lake for single women is this, you're like, this doesn't make any sense. So what I'm trying to tell you is just, just don't worry about it, just throw yourself into the lake. So how do I learn to not be idle as a single woman? Here's your lake. Serve at church to the single women. Become a soul winner. This, this is how not to be idle. Throw yourself into that lake. Study your Bible. You will have time as a single woman to study your Bible. You will be a teacher one day. You will be a teacher one day. Look, that should freak you out a little bit. That should stress you out. If you're a single woman, you want to get married, even if you have very young children, it should scare you a little bit that you're going to have to be a teacher one day. Study your Bible. Get these things. Learn, start learning these things. Prepare for motherhood. You know, you're going to become a teacher. Learn to run a home. You know, even a home business if you're a, a single lady. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm going to, you know, my daughter and I are exploring ideas on how maybe she could do some things to save some money and things like that. And just learn what the Bible says about preparing to become a wife. Now, running a home, let me get detailed on this one. You know, this is no joke. I don't even really know how it all, all works. Let me just explain my wife's day yesterday. My wife got up at 5.30 yesterday, and she started making sandwiches. And then she made sandwiches, and then she packed all these little lunches and all these types of things. We came to the church. We got everything in the, in the right. Some stuff went in the freezer. Some stuff went in the fridge. I don't know the logistics of it, but we, then we went on this trip. We got home, we drove back from the trip, we took people home. By the time we got home, it was about 7.30, close to 8 o'clock. By the time we got food and got home, and then she just starts cooking. And I'm like, what in the world? I'm like, we've done it. Stop. You know, stop doing things. What are you, what are you even cooking right now? And she's like, oh, I'm cooking for um, Sunday night and Monday. Because basically, like, the way it works in my house, I come home from work and I just walk straight to the, to the dinner table and we all sit down and eat together. Heidi calls me, and she's like, when are you going to be home? She calls me at 5. I'm like, I'll be there in 8 minutes. And I walk straight to the table from the door. But that doesn't happen on accident. 
I was working with a guy a couple years ago and his wife, he had one child and his wife, and I understand I shouldn't have said this to him, so don't, don't bring that up to me later. But his wife was gone. This was somebody I worked with. His wife was gone on a trip with her friends or something. So his mother-in-law and his mother both came to stay with him. And they both came to live with him for a week um, to help him take care of his child, his one child. And he came to work every day and he was just like grinning from ear to ear. He's like, man, he's like, I come home and the house is clean and I got, there's dinner on the table. He's like, it's crazy. And I'm like, wow, sounds like every day at my house. <laughs> and he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I'm not kidding, even a little bit. But it take, it's a big deal to, to run a home, to be that, that help me to your husband so he doesn't have to worry about those things to make sure that, you know, I don't have to worry about anything. It's just, it's just taken care of, but it doesn't happen on accident. So you need to learn how to do all these things, especially, you know, the, the teaching part. Look, my kids just, it, they just get smarter every day. I don't know what's happening, but they're just getting smarter all the time. They're learning the Bible like crazy. That's not happening on accident. You know, it's, it's not just, it's not osmosis. Someone is teaching them every day. There's a method to the madness. So, I mean, this is something that as a single woman, you should be thinking about and planning for and preparing for. And this will keep you from being idle. Okay? The lake. The lake for single men is really easy. It's really easy. The lake for single men is this. When you're done with school, like high school, you need to get to work. Amen. Period. That's the lake that you need to jump into. And here, here, let me define work for you too. There's two criteria. You need to get a 40 hour a week job. And you need to understand what that feels like. And you need to get used to that. Look, I have not worked a 40, 40 hour week job in 15 years. I can't even remember what it would be like. If I had a 40 hour week job and that's all I had to do, I'd be bored out of my mind. But I'm telling you, it's something that you get, need to get used to. Garrett, just, Garrett had about five, six weeks off when we moved here and he just went back to work a couple weeks ago and you see it, it's like And then you know, he's coming back and he's getting used to it again. But it, it is something that a man needs to be used to, okay? You, so you need to get to work. That's your lake. That's your lake. Look, it's, it's going to take, and here's why I say it's something you need to get used to. Because as a man, if you are going to raise a family on a single income, 40 hours is not going to do it. So you need to get that first hurdle done. Immediately when you get out of school, you need to get to work on a 40-hour week job. Because look, here's what happened in this country. It, it, the men went off to fight in World War II, the women went to work, the men came back home, and the women stayed at work. That's the, that's the basics of it, what happened. And when you double the workforce, and you have this economy that is based upon a double income, it is difficult to make it on a single income. That's not what the sermon's about today, but what I'm trying to tell you is that you better get used to showing up every single day at a 40-hour work job, 40-hour week job. And you better get, and if you're out of school, that needs to happen now. And if that's a, and here's the second criteria. It needs to be something that can support you. I mean, you're one person as a single person. It needs to be something that can support you. If it's not, it's not a job. Find something else. That's the bottom line. Now let me give you, I'm not going to get into this today because this is, a, this is kind of where these two sermons, sermon number four and sermon number one, kind of intersect each other. But there is a huge miss happening today in churches like ours. And I'm going to talk about that in detail on the Raising Older Children sermon. You say, what is a miss? I'm talking about an oversight. That's what I mean. Something that hasn't been thought of. A huge opportunity lost. So this is just a little preview to show up, you know, three weeks from now. Because I will give you the, the details of that. Okay, look. Brother Angel and I, he had a conversation with me yesterday before we went on the trip. And I'm not trying to scare you about this working thing, single guys and even gals. I'm not trying to scare you. But Brother Angel 
told me, he, you know, he, Brother Angel's in school. I'm not talking about him today. But he told me he got a, he's got a part-time job coming up. And hey, if that doesn't affect um, your school, it doesn't affect your church, it doesn't affect your soul winning, and it's a decent environment where you're not in a, in a bad environment, go for it. Work a few hours a week to start socking some money away. Amen. No problem there. But he told me about his plan going forward and what he wants to do full-time, and it's going to involve him working and also taking classes. And I told him, he's telling me, he's telling his counselor at school these things, and I told him, the first thing that came out of my mouth is it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. And I'm not trying to discourage you, I told him, but you need to know that it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. But here's the thing. Victory is sweeter when you've done something hard. I don't know if you guys noticed yesterday, but we walked by an overlook. We got lost on our hike. We weren't really lost. We missed a sign. We got lost on the hike, and I don't know if you guys noticed, but we overlooked that lake twice yesterday. And we went up to, when we were lost, we went to the, we were kind of on this downhill path and we were kind of lost and then we got to this lake part where you could overlook the lake. We realized we were lost, went back up the hill, and then we had to take this other trail up this crazy hill, pulling wagons and strollers and like, I was done by the time we got to the top of that hill. And then we overlooked the lake again. But you know what? It was much better the second time. Because we're like, we did it. We made it. And that's how it is. When you do something hard, it's very rewarding. So when you, when you do something hard, when you go and you pursue a path that is hard, the reward is going to be that much sweeter when you do it. So I'm trying to encourage, encourage you. I'm trying to tell you, you know, Jesus said in John 16, he's like, I have spoken to you these things that you may not be offended. That's what he said. And he's telling them about the persecution that's going to come and the things that they're going to go through. And he's like, the reason I told you is so when they do come, you're not offended. So when you go into that, this thing and it gets, it's hard, you just keep doing it. Don't be offended because you knew it was going to be hard. Because I told you it was going to be hard. So if, you know, you just recognize that it's going to be difficult. But it's worth doing. Victory is sweeter when you have to go through something hard. You should always be pushing yourself. Okay, that's the disadvantages of being single. Sin, idleness, lust, you know, lust, fornication, these things are going to be attacking you. Pride is going to be attacking you. And everything rises, comes out of pride, by the way. So that's the one you've got to watch first. Don't ever get prideful as a young single person. So you say, I want to stay single. Well, there's some advantages. Go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 7. Well, I want to make sure I give you all these advantages from Paul's perspective. Okay? From Paul's perspective. There are advantages of remaining unmarried. Look at uh, verse number 32 of 1 Corinthians 7. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried carrieth for, careth for the things that they belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There's a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So he's saying that you know, there are some advantages to being single because you can care much more for the things of the world. Let's look a little, little bit about Paul and who he was. Turn to Acts 15. Paul was a driver. Paul was somebody who was very driven. I believe that if Paul and Jehu from the Old Testament took a personality test, it would probably come up the same. Because Paul was not messing around in his ministry. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 7, you go to Acts 15, Paul says, For I would that all men were even as myself. So when Paul talks about being single in, the, in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, he's talking about that in the perspective of if you want to be single, I would prefer that you, know, you be single because you could be like me. So let's look at Paul. Look at Acts 15. How can I become a Paul, you say? 
Look, he was an evangelist sent out from Antioch. The man was extremely driven, and I want to look at the argument that he had with Barnabas in Acts chapter 15. Look at verse 35. Paul, two men of God, two men of God, and they're, they're very close brothers. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many, ulcers, many others also. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren into every city. Let's go on another missionary journey, he's saying, where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark, but Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pam Pamphylia, and went not with them to do the work. And the contention was so sharp between them, Paul would not back down, that they departed asunder from one another. So Barnabas took, so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. In Acts 13, 13, we just get a little snippet that Mark departed from Paul. That's all we really hear. And then here you see that to Paul, it was a big deal. He's like, look, if you're coming with me, we're going to work and we're not going to quit, period. And Barnabas, you know, was obviously more of a, hey, let's give people second chances, let's be long-suffering. Paul's like, no, I need people I can depend on. He's not one of them. And it got so sharp between these two men who were close together. These two men were close that they said, you go your way, I'll go mine, because I'm not taking them. He was a hard man. He was a driven man, and he was serious, and he was a hard man. And who was right? Who knows? They're probably both right. But I want you to understand that Paul was, was no joke. He was not messing around. If you were going to go along with him, you were going to stick it out, and you were going to do the work. He was a hard driver. So the first advantage of being single is this. You will have more time to serve the Lord. And Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 7. You will have more time. As a single, single person from a time perspective, you could literally dedicate your whole life to the Lord, as Paul did, right? Paul could not have done all of that while he was married. Turn to Acts 19. Think about his life. I mean, he was constantly traveling. He was taking all these crazy risks. I mean, think about it. I mean, the guy was... Look at, look at Acts 19 and verse number 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in his spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Caia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. Rome, Paul was dedicated to go to Rome, and Rome was quickly becoming the most dangerous place for a Christian. After, you know, the 60-some A.D., I mean, that's the, the, Ro the Romans, after they, you know, destroyed the temple in 70 A.D., they became, they took the place of the Jews in the persecution of the Christians. And they were trying to wipe them out, is what they were trying to do. It was terrible if you read about it. And Paul's like, I want to go to the heart of that. Because somebody needs to go there, and I'm going to go there. This is the kind of person Paul was. You know, he couldn't have taken that kind of risk. It wouldn't have been responsible for him to take that kind of risk if he was married and had children. You know, I remember at, at work one day, I worked at this power plant in North Dakota, and you will feel like this. When you get married and have children, you will have these thoughts. There was this power plant, and they had these, these chimneys that were 680 feet tall. And there was a little tiny elevator that went up to about the 20 feet from the top, and then you'd have to climb a ladder up to the top. There was something going on with the plant, and a couple uh, other engineers were like, hey, let's go up there and check it out. So I went with them, and I just remember being up there, because the, the, the chimney is so tall that in the wind, it moves three feet in every direction at the very top. It's a concrete structure that moves, and you could feel it moving when you're up there. And I remember being up there thinking, this is really stupid that I'm up here. This is dumb. You know, because, you know, I, I mean, you literally have that thought when you're married and I'm like, I got, a, I got a family depending on me and I'm doing some dumb thing that I don't even need to be doing. This is why you're not going to catch me going skydiving either. It's not that I'm afraid, it's just I don't think I should be taking risks like that when there's so many people depending on me. Paul didn't have that, is what I'm trying to get at. That's a small comparison. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's look at Paul's resume. So you can do these things when you're single. You have that option. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In 
In verse number 23, Paul says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. I mean, think about it. This guy's getting thrown in jail all the time. He's being beaten all the time. He's being whipped all the time. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, saved one. Imagine that. Imagine being whipped like that. Like five times, he said. 40, 39 stripes. 39, you know, stripes with a whip. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Remember when they thought he was, he was stoned to the point they thought he was dead. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and day have I been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters. He was shipwrecked constantly. In perils of robbers. In perils by my own countrymen. He's being stabbed in the back by people. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. He's in constant danger. In perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger, in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. This guy was constantly in danger. You know, they say, this is just a side note, but they say that the reason that the Vietnam War was so hard on soldiers mentally was because they were, you know, if you look at like the, the days of combat of, of a soldier in World War II, it wasn't, it wasn't that many days. It was like, you know, a couple weeks or something like that. But when people were in Vietnam for months and months and months at a time, they were, they were in Vietnam for six months, say, they were under constant stress of being killed. They were under constant stress of some villager killing them or the, a sneak attack of some kind. That's why the Vietnam veteran is so, um, it was such a big deal on, on them mentally because they were in so much stress constantly. Look at Paul. He was constantly in danger. That's what that reminds me of in verse number 26. Go back to 1 Corinthians 7. We see the contrast here. In verse number 2, he says, He that is married, you know, he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, but he that is married careth for the things that will please his wife. See, it's, it's a complete contrast. You can't be this guy if you're married with children. That's what Paul's saying in, in 1 Corinthians 7. So, time is a big deal. You know, the, the type of situations that Paul dedicated the time, the, his whole life, to the ministry. That, that, he gave all his time to the ministry. You can't do that if you're married with children. You know, I, I, you know we'll talk about a culture moment. You know, soul winning. You know, at Verity Baptist Church, Married families, soul winning. If you're married with children and you're a family and you go soul winning once a week, you're doing well. That's, that's the culture there. And that's going to be the culture here. You're doing well because it's hard because these men are out and they're working 40, 80 hours a week. Some of the guys, you look at the guys at Verity and you're like, oh man, he's doing really well. Yeah, ask them how many hours a week they work. There's some guys at that church that are raising families and most of the guys at that church are working their tails off. And it's a real encouragement to see me, you know, to see them show up on uh, Saturday morning soul winning, rain or shine, because most of them work on Saturdays too, or some of them do, but they always take the time. You know, one guy who's a friend of mine told me, he's like, I'm never going to quit soul winning because he's like, I need God's hand on my life. <laughs> like, I need God's hand on my life to help him with his family, to help. So, but that, that's what they can do. And if they miss Saturday, they go Sunday and they always make that sacrifice. But single people at Verity Baptist Church will go soul winning much more. You, st you see the same thing here. But it's, it's, it's that they have the time. They have the time to dedicate towards it. And you, that's an advantage of being single. Here's another advantage. You will have the resources. Turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Paul, even though he did not have to, supported himself. He was an evangelist, and he could have, you know, taken money from the church at Antioch. Or he could have taken donations from wherever he was. But look at 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 3. And let's start reading in verse number 7. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. What's he talking about? Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power. See that? He's an evangelist. He's like, you know, we could have said, hey, please feed us. 
please, uh, we're going to need some money for our trip. But he didn't do that because he didn't want to be chargeable to anyone. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some with walk, walked among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. You see that that, that idleness comes in again. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So he was being an example because he knew there was a problem in this church about people that were not working. So he's like, you know what? We're going to work. They, he said they travailed. He's a single guy. He's full-time in the ministry, being sent out by a church, and he's working night and day, he said, to support himself. They were tent makers. And they worked for their own money. So look, as a single person, just look at the obvious math of it. You will have much more resources to serve the Lord with. You think about the men in this church who have five, six, two, three, whatever kids. You know, that they have their labor and you have your labor, but theirs is divided by like five or six or whatever. I mean, the single person should have much more resources to serve the Lord with. Just resources in general. You know, you don't have five people to clothe, five people to feed, five people to, to, you know, put a roof over the head of. You know, it's just you. You know, you can do much more financially and with your time than the man and woman who is married with children. That's the bottom line. That's a serious advantage. But Paul is talking about it from his own perspective. Now, here's a side note. There's no excuse for being a single person that can't even support themselves. There's no excuse for that in the Bible. You will not find it. The Bible says that you should be able to do more, not less. Now, here's the thing. If you're wondering, you know, how this is possible, well, you're surrounded. This is part of church. You're surrounded by men in a church who have somehow figured this out. Ask, ask the question. Iron sharpeneth iron, so man sharpeneth the countenance of, his friend, countenance of his friend. There's people in this building that have figured it out. Ask. Listen, you know, it's like, it's like walking along a path with someone that's next to you and then you come to a huge hole and one person has a board and he puts the board over the hole and he walks over it and the person next to him just falls in the hole. And then you come next to a, another hole and same thing, board, fall in the hole. Board, fall in the hole. Hey, maybe ask, where'd you get the board? I mean, there's no reason to keep falling in the hole again and again and again. This is one of the biggest benefits, folks, of being in a church, is you can be edified by your brothers and sisters. Amen. It's simple. It's simple. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's look at the decision to marry, to get married. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 2. It's, Paul makes this one pretty black and white. That's what I like about this chapter. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. He covers men and women right there. Now look, we talked about staying single and we talked about you know, the advantages of that and the disadvantages of that. Um, you know, we talked about you know, to avoid idleness. You know, young women, especially 1 Timothy 5.14, how therefore that the younger woman marry, the younger women marry. Paul gives that, that prescription for the younger women, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. He's like, these, if you're going to become idle, you're going to fall into all these sins, he's like, younger women, just get married. He says to the men, he's like, hey, if you're going to, if you, to avoid fornication, it's better, you know, so you don't burn, he's like, just get married. That's, that's the prescription that he's giving. Now look, I think that for most people, men and women, the answer is to get married. That's what I think. And I believe that the Bible backs that up, you know, for two reasons. We talked about them, to avoid fornication, idleness, temptation, sin in general. Sin in general. And, and you know what? If you, if you remember, you know, learning to be idle, if you do these things long enough, you will form bad habits. You will become someone who we all hope should never get married. You will learn bad habits that frankly turn into poor character. That's what bad habits turn into, is poor character. And the second reason that I think that most people should get married is this. Most people are not Paul. 
Listen very carefully to that. He was a sent out evangelist of a church. And he was an extremely hard driving man, which is why I believe God used him. And he relied on no one to support him, even though he could have. Look, I know a lot of men today. I know evangelists today. I do not know of a Paul today. I have not seen anywhere near his equal. So all these things where he's saying, hey, single people, you know, you could be single even as I. That's a tall order. That's a tall order. That's why I believe, that's the second reason that I believe that most people should choose to get married. Is what I believe. Now in the sermon on raising older children, I'm going to get extremely detailed on how to prepare your kids to be adults that can have successful marriages and families. I'm going to get down to the nuts and bolts of it, of how you can do that. But we see here that, you know, Paul is talking about, just to wrap this up, Paul is talking about the decision to stay single or to be married. I believe most people should get married. All right? Next week, we're going to look at marriage. We're going to talk about what the Bible says about being a biblical husband to a wife. We're going to talk about what the Bible says about being a biblical wife to a husband. And then here's the big one. You can say that, you know, we're married and I'm never going to get divorced and all these things, but I want to show you what the Bible says about how to have a good marriage. Because just because you're married, just because you're a husband, and just because you're a wife, I don't want to preach the sermon next week, and you're never going to get divorced, which is what the Bible talks about, does not mean that you will have a good marriage. Having a good marriage is, you know, it takes something. So we'll talk about that next week. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, this chapter. We thank you for Paul, Lord. We thank you for um, raising up this man and choosing this man to, to uh, lead the ministry that he, he led, Lord, and all the things that, that he wrote down in the Bible with uh, your Holy Spirit, Lord, and just help us to understand these things and to, you know, move our lives in the right direction, Lord. And um, that's the point of church, is to, to read the Word of God and then to grow, which means to actually follow and, and do what the Word says, Lord. Lord, we love you. We ask that you bless the rest of this day, soul winning this afternoon at church this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.